delighted that you're here and encourage you to take your Bible and turn to a very familiar text to most of us, and that is the eighth division of the book of Acts. Most people present are very familiar with this text, so when we work through some things in the text, this is going to be familiar ground. We'll be spending all of our time in Acts 8, so I encourage you to get a Bible and turn there. If you didn't bring one, perhaps there's one in a pew close by and you can find one and we can take a look. Acts 8 begins a new section, if you recall from previous studies of the book. By being a new section, chapters 1 through 7 deal with the gospel being spread in Jerusalem. Starting in chapter 8, we have the gospel going into Judea and Samaria. So that's why we call this a new section. In chapter 8, the gospel now has been spread beyond Jerusalem to other places such as Judea and Samaria, as we've already mentioned. So this serves as a transition chapter. Uh, it is transitioning from that Jerusalem uh, focal point to beyond that. But now what I want you to pay attention to are the people that are involved in chapter 8. There are some chapters where there may only be a few people mentioned, and then there are other chapters where there are a number of people mentioned. For example, we have Saul of Tarsus mentioned here. He's not yet converted. He'll be converted in the next chapter. But we have Saul of Tarsus in verses 1 through 3. We have the disciples, Christians, generally speaking, and how many were involved, I don't know. But verses 1 to 3 mentions the disciples, New Testament Christians. Then there is Philip mentioned at verse 5. And then we have the Samaritans, verses 5 through 12. Then we have Simon, who was a sorcerer, but he was converted. And then he fell away, and then he was restored. We have him mentioned here in this context, verses 13 to 25. Peter comes to play at verse 20. And then there's the Ethiopian treasure, the eunuch, found beginning at verse 26 to the end of the chapter. There's seven that are mentioned here, but now some of those involve a number of people, like how many disciples, I'm not sure. How many were involved in the Samaritans, I'm not sure. So there's a number of people here, but what I want you to see, these people stand out because these people that are mentioned in Acts 8 were doing different things. And you're going to see what those are as the lesson unfolds. So let's talk this morning about things some people do. You say, well, that's quite a simplistic title. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> But I want to see some things that people do. And let's start with this, and you'll see what I mean by that. There are some people who make havoc of the church. We see that in verse 1 to 3. Some people make havoc of the church. Saul of Tarsus was a man who made havoc of the church. So let's look at Acts chapter 8 and in verse 3. Verse 3 says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, Dragging off men and women. Saul made havoc of the church. What's this word havoc mean? It's not one we use every day. We use it some, but not every day do we use this word havoc. It means to lay waste or to ruin. Albert Barnes suggests this word is commonly applied to wild beasts and to lions and wolves and denotes the devastations which they commit. Saul ravaged against the church like a wild beast, a strong expression denoting the zeal and the fury with which he engaged in persecution. It is not merely that Saul did some damage to the church, but he was raging against the church like a wild animal seeking its destruction. Adam Clark said this word simply means to, to devastate or to destroy to ravage signifies the act of ferocious animals such as bears and wolves and the like seeking to devour their prey. So if you could imagine this wild animal devouring its prey, that's what Paul was trying or Saul of Tarsus was trying to do to the church. A.T. Robertson says it means to dishonor, to defile, to devastate, to ruin. Now let's see how he did that. Let's go back to verse 3. Verse 3 said he did so by entering the, every house, dragging off men and women. What he did to the men and the women in the church is what he was doing to the church. So he made havoc of the church by doing some evil things to men and women. Now let's go just quickly over to the book of Galatians, if you will. Chapter 1. Paul later writes, talking about after he was converted, obviously, 
he talks about what he sought to do prior to his conversion. Look at Galatians chapter 1 and in verse 13. Look at Galatians 1 and in verse 13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. The American Standard would use the word havoc, made havoc of it. I was seeking to destroy. He was seeking to destroy the faith. Look down at verse 23, same chapter. But they were hearing only that he, was formerly he who formerly persecuted the church uh, now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. Again, the American Standard uses the word made havoc. He seeks to destroy that. He was trying to destroy the faith. Now let's make some application of that. Some today make havoc of the church. Not likely that they're seeking to destroy it in the sense that Paul was by bringing persecution on the church, but some seek to destroy the church or they are making havoc of the church by their lack of respect for authority. We've been talking about authority on Sunday nights, like 2 John 9. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight. I just meant, briefly mentioned it here about abiding within the confines of the doctrine of Christ or speaking as the oracles of God. What do we mean by lack of respect? It may be my comments that I make. It may be what I'm preaching. It may be what I'm not preaching. It may be what I'm practicing that shows little or no respect for the authority of God. All of that atmosphere makes havoc of the church. It's destroying the church, doing as much damage as perhaps the work of Saul himself. Let's go to Galatians 6 and in verse 1. Sometimes people make havoc of the church by their lack of spirituality. What do I mean by their lack of spirituality? Notice Galatians 6 and verse 1. If one is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual restore such a one. Those who are spiritually minded. The context is going to show they're feeding on the revelation of the Spirit. They're feeding on the things of God. They're trying to do the things of God. We'll not take the time to establish that from the context. But that's what the context reflects for us. That's the spiritual person. Are you spiritual? Some are destroying the church by not being spiritually minded. Being spiritually minded is different from merely being religious. You can be religious and not be deeply spiritual. You can attend church and not be deeply spiritual. You can attend all of the time and not be deeply spiritual. Are you deeply spiritual? It's safe to say that we have some among us that are not deeply spiritual. Oh, I go to church. Oh, yes. Oh, I, I, I'm religious. Oh, yes. I, I read my Bible from time to time. Oh, yes. But that's different from being deeply spiritual. When we're not deeply spiritual, we're making havoc of the church. Here's another way we make havoc of the church, and that's by conforming to the world. Be not conformed to the world. In other words, don't let the world mold and shape you to be just like it. When I yield to the pressures of the world and I'm becoming more worldly than being more spiritual and perhaps creating part of the havoc that exists within the body of Christ. When families are not what they should be. When your family is not following the direction of Ephesians 5 of the husband's role and the wife's role and the parent's role and the children's role of chapter 6. When we're not the family we should be, we're creating havoc because we're setting examples for others to imitate and maybe their families will become just like ours. And we're making havoc of the church. Another way some make havoc of the church is by the softening and tolerant spirit. Like 1 Corinthians 5, you remember they had a fornicator in their midst and they weren't doing anything about that. They were not even mourning over that. They were not concerned about his sin. They were very tolerant of his sin. And a little leaven, verse 6 says, leavens the whole lump. You see, when you let that sin go on and you're tolerant of that, then that creates more havoc within the church. The whole lump is going to be leavened. There's another way that might be done of making havoc of the church of grumbling and complaining. Like Philippians 2 talks about. There are sometimes people who just grumble and they complain about what's wrong with this church. How they're dissatisfied with this church. What they don't like about this church. And that creates something that permeates through the whole group. And that makes havoc indeed of the church. Let me ask you this question. Are you making havoc of the church? We haven't got very far in Acts 8 and I'm learning there are some people who make havoc of the church. Are you doing anything that's making havoc and destruction within the local church? But let's see something else. Some people do this. Some use every opportunity. And we see that right here in this context. There are some who use every opportunity. 
Let's go back to verses 1 and 2. When the disciples were scattered, you remember Stephen being persecuted, Acts 6, Acts 7. They stoned Stephen, and, and now he's dead. Now, beginning at chapter 8, we're back in the book of Acts, if you've left there. Now, Paul consenting to his death, and at the time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to be buried and made great lamentation over him. Now drop down to verse 4. And those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. He's talking about using opportunity. Here was the persecution causing people to be scattered. They have to go elsewhere lest they also be killed like Stephen was. And they used that opportunity to spread the word. I don't know about you. I might have been tempted had I had to drive, be driven away from Jerusalem because of the pressure, but I don't know if we want to preach the same thing Stephen did because you see what it brought him. I don't know if we want to stir up controversy over here like we did at Jerusalem when Stephen was preaching. But they went everywhere scattering the word. They used that opportunity. That wasn't the only one. Look at verse 25. We're still in Acts 8. Look at verse 25. So when they had testified and preached the word, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Peter and John spread the word on the way home. They didn't just go and preach in one area and then go back home. But as they're making their way back through on their way home, they preached in every village, the text says. They're using every opportunity they have. Well, the only one. Notice Philip, beginning at verse 30. He used the occasion of coming in contact with a man riding along reading the scriptures and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And use that as an opportunity to teach him. That's not the last case in Acts 8. Look at verse 40. Philip preached in all the cities that he passed through after he had left the eunuch. Verse 40 said, he was found at Azotus and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I see some people use every opportunity they have. In fact, Acts 8 is filled with those examples. Here's what I learned from that. That we ought to use every opportunity we have to teach someone the gospel, for example. The Great Commission said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's given to me and to you. That's individuals. That wasn't a command, by the way, given to the church. You'll look long and hard to find the context saying, this is what the church does. I contribute my money, and so the church does that. So we're fulfilling that. This is an individual responsibility. Go preach the gospel to every creature. That's to me, and that's to you. Some people need to use that opportunity. I mean, some people use every opportunity, and others of us have opportunities on a daily basis that we let slip by that we didn't use that as an opportunity to teach the gospel. We should use every opportunity to restore the erring. You, but you're spiritual. Are you the spiritual? Then restore them. That's our job. James chapter 5 says the same kind of thing. We need to use every opportunity to encourage the weak. Let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians 5. A couple of points we want to make from 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul writes to the Thessalonians that I exhort you, warn those who are unruly. That's the disorderly. They need to be warned. You're, 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 you're in danger of losing your soul if you die. But there are those in another class that are mentioned at verse 14. Comfort the faint-hearted and uphold the weak. We need to encourage the weak. We need to encourage them. Here's someone who's weak. They're, they're, they're spiritually weak. They're not disorderly, they're just spiritually weak. Maybe we have an opportunity to encourage them. We need to use every opportunity to warn the unfaithful. That's what he said first. Warn those who are unruly. They've rebelled against the Lord. We need to use every opportunity to teach our children. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 6. You are familiar with the first reference here at verse 7 where the Jews were told, this was on the eve of going into the land of Canaan, when you get there, what Moses is preaching is, you teach them diligently to your children. You take the message and take it to your own heart, and then you teach it diligently to your children. I got that. We talk about that often. Let's drop down to verse 20. Look at verse 20. That when your son asks in time to come, what's the meaning of these testimony, statutes, and judgments which the Lord commanded you? Here's an opportunity. Saying the time's coming that not only are you to teach these diligently to your children, there's going to be a time when your children raise questions and there's a teaching moment. 
They're going to ask, look back to verse 20. They're going to say, what's the meaning of these testimony, statutes, and judgments which the Lord commanded you? And so here's what you're going to tell them. You're going to tell them we were slaves in the land of Egypt. The Lord brought us up out of the land of Egypt and showed us signs and wonders. We're going to tell about our history. We're going to tell about the power of God. And we're going to tell them, verse 24, God gave us commands that are for our good always. Here's a teaching moment. We're going to use every opportunity to teach our children. Here, here's a moment right here where we can make application of that lesson we learned in Bible class. Here's a time where we can put this principle that was preached the other day into practice. That's what Deuteronomy 6 is about. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you talk of them. Use every opportunity. We ought to use every opportunity to do good. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good. And to all men especially those of the household of faith. Let me ask you this question. Are you using every opportunity? Some people used every opportunity in Acts 8. Here's another thing that some people do. Some people make dramatic changes. Some people make dramatic changes. Let's go back to Acts 8. If you've left that, perhaps you're in Deuteronomy now. Go back to Acts 8. And let's look at some examples in the cases of conversion. And these cases of conversion that are found in Acts 8 are the most unlikely prospects. In other words, if we were living in the time and we knew the people and we knew the gospel had come, we'd think, this is not the kind of people that are interested in the gospel, I want to tell you. These are the most unlikely prospects, like the Samaritans, for example. Look at beginning at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Philip, do you know who you're dealing with? Do you know the kind of people you're talking to? Do you think you're going to do any good when you get there? What were the Samaritans like? Well, they were a mixed breed. They were a mixed race. They had no dealings with the Jews. For a Jew to stand before them was not a thing they would be willing to accept on most occasions. There was no dealing with the Samaritans and the Jews. They had polluted worship and mixed the worship of one God with idolatry worship, as 2 Kings indicates for us in chapter 17 and in verse 29. So when they're converted, here are a group of people who had to make dramatic changes in their life. It's not that they were close to being Christians and they just have to tweak their life a little bit and now they're on the right track. They had to make a dramatic change. And they did. Let's talk about another case. Let's begin at verse 9. Simon. What do we know about Simon? Look beginning at verse 9. There was a certain man called Simon, that is in Samaria, who had previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is, uh, is the great power of God. And then they heeded him because he, was, he had astonished them with sorceries for a long time. What do we know about Simon? Well, Simon was a sorcerer, verse 9 says. He was a religious leader. Now, you want to talk about somebody that's not a likely candidate for conversion is not only a religious person, but a religious leader. Here was a man who was a sorcerer, a religious leader, and he had been at this for a long, long time. It wasn't that he just got into sorcery, didn't really understand it, but he'd been there for a good while. I want to tell you, when he was converted, he made a complete turnaround. Had to give up his sorcery. Had to give up his religion for a long time. No longer is he a leader in the religion where he had been a leader. What dramatic changes had been made. He's not the only one. Nor were the Samaritans. There's the Ethiopian treasurer, the eunuch. Let's drop down now to verse 26 in the context. This man was an Ethiopian. Verse 27. He's not a Jew. Listening to what a Jew would have to say. He was the queen's treasurer. He was a man, verse 27, of great authority. Not many people of great authority are interested in spiritual things, let alone the things of God. Do you know many people in Congress that are New Testament Christians? Do you know any, many governors? Many mighty people in the world? You don't know many of those, do you? Not many people in that position are in harmony with what you find written in the New Testament. And yet he was a religious man. Look at verse 20, 28. He thought he was right. He was riding along to, uh, in the chariot. He went to Jerusalem, as the King James says, for to worship. He's a very religious man. And yet he made changes. 
dramatic changes. Now, here's what I'm learning from that. You may need to make some dramatic changes in order to be right, just like these cases. Some people make dramatic changes. You may need to make some dramatic changes in order to be a Christian. So I want to be a Christian, and, and, but, but I'm not so sure I want to make those changes. You may have to make some dramatic changes. Acts 26, 28, Agrippa said, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. You want, there's going to be some real changes that take place, but I'm not sure I'm committed to that just yet. You may need to have to change your attitude. You may have to change some attitudes. Maybe the shift that needs to be made is a great shift in attitude. And I cite Proverbs 23, 7. We all are familiar with Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, it's focusing on a man's attitude, not what he says. It's in the context of a miser who says, eat, eat, when he really doesn't want you to eat. He, he hopes you don't eat. But he's saying one thing, but his attitude is the thing that's wrong. It may be my attitude needs to change. I may need to make dramatic changes in my attitude. I may need to make some dramatic changes in the home life. Maybe it's the way you treat your wife. Maybe you're not treating her as that weaker vessel, as something fragile. Maybe you're not treating her with, as an heir together of the grace of life, like an equal. Maybe you're not treating your husband with the respect of Ephesians 5. Or maybe you're not treating him as with the submission. Maybe you're not honoring one another. Maybe it's in your prayer life where there's some dramatic changes. Maybe you need to pray more and more often, more frequently, as Jesus did in Mark 1 and verse 35. It may be in your study habits. Remember the Bereans search the scriptures daily? Are, are you reading and studying the text? And continuing to read and study the text and continuing to read and study the text. Maybe where you need to make dramatic changes is in your being faithful and dedicated, like being faithful to the point of dying even. Revelation 2 and in verse 10. Maybe it's in your priorities where you need to make some dramatic changes. That you've got some, uh, God's important in my life, but there are other things that are more important. Maybe I need to make some dramatic changes. Let me ask you a question. Do you need to make some dramatic changes in your life like they did in Acts chapter 8? Here's something else that people do. Some try to get right things the wrong way. Some people try to get right things the wrong way. Simon tried to get the Holy Spirit with money. Let's go back to Acts 8 if you've left there. And let's notice in Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 18, that when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Saying, verse 19, give me this power, that, uh, power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, he witnessed the power of the apostles, verse 13, verse 17, the text says, and he wanted the very same thing. I want to have that same power. So he offered money in order to get that. But then notice at verse 20, it was the wrong way to get it. Look at verse 20. But Peter said, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. That's not how you get it. How was it given? Verse 17, through the laying on of the apostles' hands. You don't get it through purchase of money. That's not how, so you're going about it the wrong way. But furthermore, furthermore, there's another point to be made. Look at verse 21. What you're wanting isn't for you. It was only for the apostles. Look at verse 21. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. The idea of a part has to do with that which is assigned. This has been assigned to the apostles. It hasn't been assigned to you. That which is the portion is something that's won or given. It wasn't given to you. It was given to the apostles. See, the apostles, that's why they had to come down to do this is because the apostles could lay hands on and impart spiritual gifts, but that's not for anyone else. It's for the apostles. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. It's not for you. That you thought, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. I want to suggest to you that often we try to get the right thing the wrong way. How so? Just like Simon. We want to live the Christian life without ever obeying the gospel. I want to be thought to be a Christian. I want to live the Christian life. I want to live like Christians. I want to be considered among the faithful. 
I, I want to live in the church life. I, I want to live within the church. I want to, to go to church. I want to worship God. I want to be accepted and embraced as a Christian. But have you obeyed the gospel? In other words, have you been baptized? And did you, no, I, I'm, I'm not. I don't know that I need to do that. I don't want to do that, but I want to be viewed as a Christian. You're trying to get the right thing, but you're getting it the wrong way. There's another thing. Sometimes we want knowledge, but we want to do it with shallow study. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to have this knowledge of this book. I don't understand the book of Romans. I, don't, I, I can't comprehend Revelation. I, I want to, Daniel is, is challenged to me. I want to understand it. But I want the quick version of that. I want the cliff notes. Where I don't want to put the time and the study into that like everyone. I, I just don't want to do that. I want knowledge with shallow study. I want the right thing, but I want to get it the wrong way. There's something else we might do. I want spirituality without effort. I want to be a spiritual person. Well, now here's what you're going to have. No, I'm not interested in doing all the things that, that you, you talk about in the pulpit. of doing. I don't want to do that, but I want spiritual. I, I want to be considered a spiritual person, but I don't want to put the effort into that. I don't want to make sacrifices. I want to have influence on the sinner, so I'm going to do it with compromise. That's the right thing, to have influence on a sinner. I want to win people to Christ. I, I want us to invite people and I want them to come to the Lord, but let's make some compromises in order to, to do that. We're going about the right thing the wrong way. I want godly children without giving emphasis to the spiritual. See, I want my children to grow up and I want them to be spiritually minded. I want them to be people who, I want godly, I want children that walk in the fear of God. That's what I want. But I'm not willing to give emphasis to the spiritual while I'm raising my children. I want the right thing, but I want to do it on my terms. I want it the way I want it. I want to give to the Holy Spirit, but I want to buy it. That's what I want. I want the right thing, but I want it the wrong way. But let's shift gears. We saw something else in Acts 8 just a moment ago. There are times we want what we can't have. So not only did Peter say to Simon, Simon, you're going about it the wrong way. You're trying to purchase it when you can't purchase it. But furthermore, Simon, this isn't even for you. You're wanting something that doesn't belong to you. You were not appointed to this. You, didn't give, you weren't given this. It was for the apostles. So here's something I'm learning. There are times we want what we can't have. For example, I want a marriage that's unscriptural. I want to be married to this person. I divorced this one. I'm ready to be married to this one. And I want to keep this marriage. And I want to have this marriage. And I want God's approval. I want your approval. That's not for you. Because Jesus said in Matthew 19 in verse 9, that the man who puts away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoso marries her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And so that unscriptural marriage is not for you. Here's something else we want that's not ours. I want a leading role in the family. I want a leading role in the church when maybe it wasn't appointed for you. Here's the wife that wants the leading role. I really want to be the leader in this family. Or here is someone who says, you know what, I, a woman that wants to be the leader in the church, I want to take leadership roles. When that was limited in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, permit not a woman to, the text says, she is not to teach or usurp authority over a man. Or it may be this, it may be I want to be the head of the family that was given for the husband. Or maybe someone covets another's mate. Like Proverbs 5. I'm looking for something that I don't have a right to have. I'm seeking revenge. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. This one perhaps is a little more common than some of the others. I seek revenge that actually God says that's not for you. You weren't appointed to that. Do you remember the passage says, verse 19, I'm at Romans chapter uh, 12. Let's look at verse 17 to begin with. Repay no one evil for evil, have regard for the good inside of all men. In other words, when someone does you wrong, you don't do them wrong back. Now verse 19, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. In other words, don't seek revenge. Don't seek to get even. Now why is that? Because you need to give place to wrath. In other words, get out of that seat of executing wrath because that's not your seat. Why is that? Read with me now. Look at verse 19. For it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The Lord said, that's my seat. That's not for you. You weren't appointed to that. You didn't win that seat. 
You weren't given that seat. I didn't put you there. That's not your place. You're sitting in my seat. Get out of my seat. Vengeance is mine. That's my seat. That's not for you. Sometimes we want what we can't have. Let me ask you two questions. Are you trying to get the right thing the wrong way? I want this, and it's the right thing, but I want to go about it my way, like Simon. Or is it that you're seeking something that you can't even have? It was not appointed to you. Here's something else people do. Let's go back to Acts chapter 8. Some people fall away. Obviously, we're talking about Simon. So let's go back to Acts chapter 8. After becoming a Christian, Simon sinned and endangered his soul. So let's notice this beginning at verse 20. Uh, verse 20. That Peter said to him at verse 20, he said, Your money perished with you. You might underline that word perish. Your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart be forgiven you. For I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of those things which you have spoken of come upon me. Now let's see what we just saw. Go back to verse 22. What Peter said is your actions were wicked. You just offered to buy the Holy Spirit with money. And so your actions were wicked. You're bound up by iniquity. In other words, you're involved in sin. It's a, you are bound or you are enslaved to sin. So you're involved in wickedness, you're involved in sin. Notice furthermore, verse 22, your, your thoughts are not right. Look at verse 22, if perhaps the thought of your heart be forgiven you. Back to verse 20 where we started. You're going to perish if you don't repent. Your money perish with you. Was Simon in danger? Now earlier, earlier, just to get our bearings, let's back up to verse 12. That... Uh, Verse 13, rather, Simon himself also believed and was baptized. He had obeyed the gospel. He had become a Christian. So in very short order, now he's committed sin. How bad was it? It was wicked. He's bound by iniquity. His thoughts were wrong and needed to be forgiven. And he's going to perish if he didn't repent. Now, I want to suggest to you that some fall away today just like Simon did. Sometimes people do that because of fleshly desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What they want, what they desire, what they wish they could do. Some do that because of the cares and the pleasures. Remember, some of the seed fell among the thorns, and they were taken away by the cares and the pleasures of life. Luke 8 and verse 14. Some because they are misled. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 where the Galatians <clears throat> had heard the gospel, they had responded to the gospel, they had received the gospel. Look at Galatians 5 and verse 7. He said, you did run well. That's the King James wording of that. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the gospel? Somebody hindered you. Who was that? Perhaps it was the Judaizing teachers. So some are falling away because of fleshly desires, some because of the cares and pleasures, and others are misled, and some because of the friends they have and the associates they run with. Proverbs 1, they'll say, come let us lie and wait for those who and shed innocent blood. Come and be a part of the crowd. Let us cast one purse. Come and be a part of the crowd. Some are falling away because they're not growing as they should from the time you ought to be teachers. We just went through that in Hebrews chapter 5. Let me ask you this question. Are you beginning to drift and to fall? Simon did. In fact, he did it rather soon. And now he's bound by iniquity. Are you, are you beginning to get away from the Lord? Are you beginning to drift? Are you bound by iniquity? Let me tell you something else some people do. Some are restored. Some fall away and are never restored. That's the sad story. But one of the brighter sides is some who fall away are restored and they come back to the Lord. And Simon is a case of that. Let's see what happened with Simon. Simon was quickly restored. He heard the message that he was bound by iniquity, that he was involved in wickedness, that his heart was not right in the sight of God, and he was made to realize that indeed he was in sin. Here's what he was told, verse 22. He was told this at verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart be forgiven you. 
What Peter said is, here's what you need to do, Simon. You need to repent of what you've done, and you need to pray God for forgiveness of that. Maybe God will forgive you. Now look at verse 24. He said to Peter, he said, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things of which you've spoken may come upon me. That is, that I might perish. I don't want to perish. I don't want to continue to be bound in iniquity. I don't want to continue in wickedness. Pray for me that I might be forgiven. Here's what I learned from that. You too can be restored. If you've drifted from God, you can be, be restored by doing the very same thing he was told to do. Look back at verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart be forgiven you. Let's add another passage to that. Look at James chapter 5. James says that confess your trespasses to one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. You can be restored too. Are you in need of being restored have you committed the kind of sin like Simon did where you've drifted away from God and you're now bound in iniquity? You'd lose your soul if you don't make some changes. You can repent and you can pray God. You can confess your sin before God and before others. Look at 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 7. 1 John 1 and in verse 7, the text says, we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And notice this, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Do you know that statement is made to Christians? It's not written to the, to the uh, alien sinner, to the world, but to the Christian that when we sin, the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us from all sin. You can be free of the guilt of every sin you've committed. You too can be restored, starting over as if you'd never sinned before. That's what's happening to Simon. He's starting over like he had never committed this sin. He's restored. Let me ask you, do you need to be restored? Are you in a condition where if you died in your condition without making some changes that you're going to lose your soul? Do you need to be restored? You can be restored. Some people are restored. Simon was, but we're not through. There are some people that seek help and understanding. Some don't, but there are some who do. Let's take the case of the eunuch. The eunuch sought help in understanding what the text said. Let's go to verse 31. You're familiar with the story. He's riding along reading from Isaiah the prophet. He's reading from Isaiah 53, as the text records. Look at verse 32. We see the text that he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and a lamb silent before his shear, so opened not his mouth. And in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life was taken from the earth? And so the first question that was asked, look at verse 31, when he was asked, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I accept someone guide me? I need help in understanding this text. I need help. So he's seeking help in understanding the text. He raised a question about the text. He didn't just say, I don't understand it. But he raised a question about this text. And here was his first question. Look at verse 34. He said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? I read this text. I don't understand what the prophet's talking about. Is he talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? Can you help me, Philip, understand what this text is talking about? I need help and understand. How can I let, unless someone guide me? I want to know the answer to that question. Can, can, he, can you help me understand if he's talking about himself or some other man? Look at verse 36. Verse 36 tells me he had the attitude that, and a heart that was willing to learn. For as they went on their way, they came to a certain water and said, See, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? That is, Philip had begun at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He explained, Isaiah 53 is a promise of the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He was convinced of that. And that's why he's willing to do this, because he's willing to learn. Now notice the attitude of the, of the eunuch. He's willing to learn. He wants some help, and he raises questions about the text so he can learn. I want to suggest to you a love for the word means that you'll seek to understand. Let's go back to the Psalms. The 119th Psalm, that long Psalm that talks about our love and respect for the word. Let's look at two verses here. Look at verse 97. Oh, how I love thy, your law. Does that describe your attitude? I love the law of God. I love the word of God. I love the revelation of God. We're not through. Look at the rest of verse 97. It is my meditation all the day. I think on it all the time. That I reflect on the law. I love it. And so when I see it, I reflect and I think upon it. Drop down to verse 127. 
127, Therefore I love your commandments more than go, yes, than find go. In other words, if I had gold over here on one side and the law of God on the other and I couldn't have both, I love the word more than I love gold, more than material things. It means more to me. If we genuinely love the word, we're going to seek to understand it. So let's go back to Acts chapter 8. If we have this love for the word, we're going to read it and we're going to read it often and we're going to read it thoroughly. Let's go back to Acts 8 and verse 28. He was riding along reading Isaiah the prophet. It implies to me that he's reading it often. He seems to want to read it thoroughly because he's raising questions. He doesn't just read through that and say, well, you know what? I read Isaiah 53 today. I think I'll read chapter 54 tomorrow. But he starts raising questions. What's, what's he talking about? Who's he talking about? Could he be talking about himself or could he be talking about some other man? It means you'll raise questions. You'll seek help from those who can help you. Go back to verse 35 now. Then Philip began at the same scripture and preached Jesus unto him. Now beginning at verse 35, he desires to see application to himself. He doesn't just want to learn the word in theory. He wants to make application to himself and that he did in this very context. Can you imagine the eunuch saying, you know, I'm not really interested in your study. I'm just kind of curious, but I'm not really interested in you explaining this to me. I'm not interested in how this applies to me. I really don't care what Isaiah was really saying. I just kind of wanted to read that. Some people seek understanding from the Word. Let me ask you a question. Do you seek all the help you can get in understanding the text? Do you try to get all the help that you can get? You read the text. Do you fully understand it? You say, well, no, I don't understand everything. Have you gleaned everything that you can get out of that text? Well, no, I haven't done that. Are you seeking to get all the help you can get in understanding the text like the eunuch did? But here's something else. Some act immediately. We're talking about some things that some people do. Some people act immediately when they see something needs to be done. In each of the cases of conversion that are recorded in this chapter, they acted immediately. Let's start with the Samaritans earlier in the chapter. Look at verse 12. Go back to Acts 8 and verse 12. The Samaritans, verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. No indication that they were taught the gospel and then years later it bore fruit. Sometimes that happens. And then they decided years later to be baptized. When they heard him preaching, they were baptized, both men and women. Their response was immediate. We see a change. We see what the gospel says. We're going to do that. Let's go to the next example. Simon. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Simon saw, Simon heard. Simon believed, and Simon responded immediately, not years later. Well, let's go to the other example in the context, and that's the case of the eunuch. Riding along in the chariot while he's hearing the explanation of, of uh, Isaiah 53, the text says, he said, well, see, here's water. He learned something in that preaching about obeying Jesus and about being baptized, and when he saw water, he said, what keeps me from being baptized right now? He immediately responded. I want to suggest to you there's a need for you to act immediately. If you're not a Christian, there's a need for you to act immediately. Why is that the case? Because Christ could return. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2 says, He'll come as a thief in the night without warning. You're not going to get a warning that probably it's going to happen tomorrow. I hear the sound of the trumpet and it's going to last for 24 hours before He comes. That's not going to happen, but He's going to come immediately as a thief in the night. What will we be doing? Matthew 24, the latter part of it indicates that what we're going to be doing is what we normally do in our daily life. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. So why do I need to act immediately like they did? Why did they need to? Because Christ could come immediately. Because you could die. Your life's a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. And thirdly, because your heart could become hardened in sin. Today, if you'll hear his voice, quoting from Psalm 95, today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. That means if you don't obey today, the chances are increased your heart could become hardened in sin. You need to act immediately. Let me ask you this. Are you ready to act today? What hinders you? 
If you haven't obeyed the gospel, would you do that even this very morning? What keeps you from being obedient to the gospel? Here's things that some people do. Some people make havoc of the church. Are you making havoc of the church? Some people use every opportunity they have to serve the Lord. Are you using every opportunity? Some people make some dramatic changes. That may be required of me. That may be required of you. Some people try to get the right thing the wrong way. We often do that. Some people fall away. Some people are restored. Some people seek understanding. And some people act immediately. Do you need to act immediately this morning? Do you need to respond to the invitation of the gospel? You're not a Christian. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?